example. But I couldn't figure out, you know, this is a I walk in and just balancing, balancing. this example that we started um, all the way through simulating it and, um, and visualizing it. Hopefully, we'll see how the pace goes. But uh, this was the example I proposed. It's a made up system. Um, but I, I sort of picked it so that it had um, all the pieces that you might need to informing FR and FR star. And, uh, we have a, a particle here, MA, MA that is attached to a wall. It will vibrate. The free length of this spring is uh, in node 2. I'm assuming that the free length is uh, Q1 equals 0. Okay? And, and this particle will be able to pass through the wall. Um, it slides along, that particle slides along the rod. Then we have a compound pendulum that is swinging from a pin joint at that particle that has a mass center that's a little off. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's not a good issue. Okay, now that we got the mic back on, actually, I don't think anybody's watching anymore, but I'm going to. We uh, uh, recording them anyways, but. Uh, Anyways, uh, we're going to do this example, and um, we've got this compound pendulum that swings from the particle uh, with the mass center located here along the line between points PAB and PBC. And then we have um, two, what I'm going to call specified forces and torques. Right? We haven't defined what those are in terms of um, how they behave with respect to time, uh, but they're... Uh, generic forces and torques that we could apply at the point and the torque between um, the in frame and the B frame. Then we have a particle, MC, that's hanging from a simple pendulum um, at this pin joint, and then there's a torque here, and we have gravity. So we have uh, a number of uh, forces and torques uh, that are applied to the system. It's basically a double pendulum that can um, um, slide. It's, it's, a, it's typically it's a, it's a variation of the um, double, double pendulum on a cart problem. Right? And, uh, but it's got a few more pieces there. We wrote out what FR and FR star are going to have to be. FR are all of these external loads. So we have the resultant on the three particles right, that have mass, uh, where this one is um, the center of mass of the rigid body, and then we have the resultant torque on body B. And then FR star, which are the forces, the generalized inertia forces, all those due to the masses and inertia and the accelerations of those in the system. Um, we have the linear acceleration of the, part the uh, particles, including the mass center of the object, and then we have uh, this term here that captures the uh, time derivative of the angular momentum dotted with uh, not um, dotted with the omega r for the rotation of the rigid body. And then we uh, started here writing out these forces. That's basically the, the new thing that we have not done. We've, we've got uh, the resultant um, on PA, B, the resultant on PC, right? This one has force, the spring and the damper. This one only has gravity. Uh, the resultant on PO only has gravity. And we have skipped over non-contributing forces, and those non-contributing forces are associated uh, the, key, the main one that we've eliminated here are the um, um, connection, any forces that are smooth between smooth connections between bodies. In this case, we have all pin joints. So there's no uh, pin joints and sliders, right? Everything's smooth. We don't have to worry about those. And then I eliminated 
mg on the top particle because we know that it can't move up and down, and that is uh, um, uh, will not contribute to the motion either. And then lastly, we wrote the sum of the torques on rigid body B. So if I, uh, I think about holding that compound pendulum portion still, and if I push up through a positive Q3, it's going to apply a torque like so to the body. And then we have a predefined torque that I already defined in a positive sense with respect to the vector pointing out of the board. And we've added those up right there for all the torques on B. And I forgot one, at, one little detail, and those are in the um, in Z hat direction. Right? So all these are vectors. And now um, we can form FR and FR star. But I'm going to do that using SymPy instead of on, on the board. Any questions? about this whole setup here, right? That, that's all, all we need to get the equations of motion of that, that particular system. Chris? You could have any nonlinear function you want. If you can write it analytically, then you could write it analytically as a SymPy thing. Some, some things are not that easy to write analytically. Um, and I'll show you how we, you can, when we jump to the numerical land, you could, you could make a complex numerical function that could generate that, that force if it um, wasn't, wasn't too easy to write symbolically. Most things you can um, write symbolically, but, but you do come across things that are highly um, discontinuous and uh, things may break down. Sim SymPy has a piecewise symbolic function, for example. So you could, if you, if you want an if statement that says, well, if we're in this stage, um, the force should be this, and else it should be this, you can write that as, a, as an analytic piecewise, and SymPy will do the right thing, um, too. Uh, but there, there's some cases where you know, does that answer that? So yeah, any anything you want to write here, we're we're not linear, linear we're not limited to any kind of linear behavior. Um, I picked those just just for convenience. And um, the uh, one of the topics um, that we could go over is uh, linearization of of the systems. Okay, so there's uh, some things to think about with that. Um, I, by the way, I put up the, uh, a little vote poll um, with a list of topics. I think uh, one or two people have uh, checked some of those off. So um, this week, fill that thing out, and, um, and I'll, in the material for next week after Thanksgiving, I'll have, um, we can start on some of these other topics, okay? And, uh, and if you have one that I don't have listed, just add it to the bottom of the note where you can type in, and I can... Uh, I may not I may not be able to do any random topic off the off the cuff, but uh, we'll see. Okay. All right. Any other questions here on this problem definition? Oh yeah, I've got to. Let me just move over to first installing. Okay, so if you want to open up SymPy or open up a bicycle, I'm going to keep that picture open. Okay, I'm going to fire up a new Python 3 notebook and go ahead and Type our favorite um, couple of few commands. All 
Right. So um, we listed out all of the um, coordinates and speeds um, and uh, constants of the system. So let's go ahead and uh, just get those um, created. So these are going to be our generalized coordinates, Q1, Q2, Q3. I'm going to try to put a little bit of All right, so these are all functions of time. Uh, we're additionally going to have, um, I'm going to call these specified inputs, okay? And these are also functions of time. We have this force and torque that I use these two symbols for. And um, these are special. Right? They're not, they are functions of time, potentially. They could be constant with respect to time, um, if I just had a constant force or a constant torque. But um, we're going to make them very general so that we could um, specify them to be anything we might. Maybe we want, we want a, um, um, a sinusoidal um, forcing function or something like that, or any kind of function that you can imagine. And, and this will tie into your question about how can we make other more complex forces. Um, so, we got those. <clears throat> Let's get all of the uh, system constants. And we have, let's see, we've got the spring constant K, spring con uh, damper uh, constant, damping coefficient there, C. We've got um, mass A, mass of the body B. And we've got mass C. The uh, body B is going to have an inertia scalar about its center of mass. I'm going to call it B, um, I, B with respect to BO. So we know that that's what that is. Uh, we also have a length of the pendulum. Uh, both pendulums are the same length. And those are the masses. We've got a torsional spring constant, KT. I think that's all. Am I missing any there? Oh, G. And then um, the acceleration due to gravity. So I think this is all. These, right, are not dynamic symbols. So we'll use um, this. I'll just copy that. And I'm going to fix up a couple of these so they display nicely. If I use an underscore here, SimPy will make those uh, symbols uh, have subscripts. This um, IB, I could do that, I believe, and then KT. And then we could check a couple of those, like what does IB, BO look like? There we go. So we got subscripts, so those look, look decent. Um, those are our constants. Now, let's go ahead and set up reference frames. Uh, we have an inertial reference frame in. And then um, we've got this reference frame B. Call it B. We're going to do an axis rotation. And um, it's going to be about uh, Q2 in the NZ direction. And then we've, we're going to make an auxiliary. And B is the reference frame that's going to be attached to the body B. And then I'll make an auxiliary reference frame C that is not attached to a rigid body, but uh, will help us when we define the velocities for that particle C on, this, on the simple pendulum. So that one will do orient new, C, axis. What um, did you all, you all have a figure drawn that you can see? Or 
be nice if I could show both. That's going to be the Q3 and also about NC. So the next step um, is um, angular velocities. And the reason, and I'm going to do these before I do positions, so that we can define the angular velocities in terms of our generalized speeds. Okay? I want to go ahead and get those defined. <clears throat> so, yes? So we... Um, uh, you can you could add more reference frames. Oh, you're talking about the um, one sliding. Well, <clears throat> that's a that's a good question. You you could add one, but recall that um, one key thing here to remember is that uh, the way I've defined reference frames in this class, they have nothing to do with position. And that thing only changes position. It's a particle; it doesn't rotate. So we don't we don't need a reference frame to tell us any new information about that. Um, many dynamics classes, probably most, for, um, you know, have the concept of a reference frame that translates and rotates. And in our case, that's not true. So that's the key, the key difference. Reference frames describe re orientation, and points describe position. And we're going to keep, the, and keep those separate. And we, and we do so because... Um, it's a, it's a useful way to um, think about that. It's, it's odd to say, like if you go to, this, this drives me nuts, I'll show it to you, probably still the same. Wikipedia, uh, if I go to uh, Angular Velocity article, I believe, the first example here says, the angular velocity of the particle at da, da da How does a particle have angular velocity if it has no, uh, if it takes up no space? Right? So in our class, <laughs> I would say we, we created a reference frame C that uh, rotates with this line, and we would say the angular velocity of the, of the uh, reference frame is something. Uh, but I, I find this um, odd to say, you know, and I'm not sure why that is in the vernacular of um, dynamics in general. So it's sort of weird, like uh, um, they have this extra stuff here, but, um, but really a particle doesn't um, have any shape, so I'm not sure how you can tell that it has reference. So, uh, I um, haven't bothered to try to rewrite this article. Um, I did leave a note on the talk page, but I don't know if any, how many people agree. So, you know, you can talk about all this stuff uh, with different views, but uh, the way that I've presented it here, that sort of, that sort of comes from Keynes, um, you know, description, is uh, we think of particles as an infinitesimally small dot. So... Long-winded answer to your uh, question there. Um, so the angular velocities, um, B, I can set its angular velocity in N. And I'm here, this is a key thing. I want to define these. I could, I could let it calculate it itself and it would take the derivative of Q2, give me Q2 dot, but we want to define our velocities in terms of the generalized speeds so that we can take partial velocities of them. So here, let's go ahead and do that. And then C, go ahead and set what C would be. And we're just having U1 equals Q1 dot, U2 equals Q2 dot. U3 equals Q3 dot. Speaking of that, we should probably have another section.
So um, I think uh, it's probably better to put this section before we move into, right? We want to define what our generalized speeds are. And later on, we will use this definition. So um, I've written right here this. But note that that equation can also be written as um, uh, 0 equals ui minus dot q i. Why doesn't it like my math? Okay, there's a lot of things in SymPy that um, you write the equation set to zero and then solve for variables. Um, you can use other things, but um, th uh, this is the way that we're going to need to write it for what we'll do in a few minutes. So I'm going to write a create a, a little variable here called KDEs, and I'm going to make it a list of U1 minus Q1 diff u2 minus q2 diff and u3 minus q3 diff. So if you, if you were not going to pick the simple definitions, um, you, may need, you would need to calculate some velocities first. Um, look at what they look like in terms of the q dots and then make that selection. Okay, so there may be a step here where you actually calculate a bunch of velocities and then determine if you want to use um, use that will help simplify things down the road. But this always works, and um, it really, uh, I think that the main advantage of choosing use that are other than this are that um, if you want to get your equations in an analytically understandable form, right, and they're not too giant, you can select those and, and get them com compact and maybe make analytical understanding of what's going on in the system. Uh, but for a lot of really complicated systems, it, um, it'll make the equation shorter, but they're still not short enough for you to really make a lot of sense of them in terms of analytics. So here's our kinematic differential equations. Um, if you set this angle of velocity correctly, we would have got, um, uh, you can set it in terms of a B, and it's just going to be U2 times NZ. So those are our angular velocities. Now we can move on to linear positions. Um, I'll just call it points. And we can define these points. Our first point is going to be this point O that is the origin. And then we're going to calculate all um, other points with respect to that. And then we have, um, I call it PAB equals, um, I'm going to use O.locate new. PAB. And then um, that was uh, Q1 times NX. And then we had um, the center of mass, P, um, which I just called BO. And that equals, um, we can locate that from PAB relatively easily. Call that BO. And then this is going to be negative um, 2 times L divided by 3, 2 thirds of the length times. Uh, b dot y. So it's in the negative b dot y direction as I define my system. And then we have the uh, second joint, which are called PBC. And um, we'll locate that also from PAB. You, get, you can create that one. That's Okay, new. 
Is everybody following that? You got the, you have a sketch of the system? It's hard to follow it probably without the sketch. I could try to bring it up. Uh, oh yeah, nice. You got yours embedded in the in the thing. BC. Negative two, uh, negative L times BY. And then we've got one more point that's at um, the bob on the simple pendulum, PC. And then we'll locate that from uh, PBC as it's most convenient. And that's going to be also negative L times, in this case, C dot Y. So then you could look at uh, P dot position from O, for example, and uh, express that in different reference frames, whatever you want. But we've look, mapped out those points there. And, and note, I got, I got the full mapping of that point right without having any new reference frame or anything um, for that first point. Okay, so now let's do uh, linear velocities. And I'm uh, purposely doing this in a particular, this, is, this order is uh, the standard, I would say the standard flow that I do these problems. Um, it doesn't have to follow exactly like that, but um, um, the SimPy mechanics does is sort of looking for this basic flow. And if there's a few things you can do out of order, but not. So, um, oh, yeah, thank you. Very nice. Yep, U1 is the linear velocity. So those should be U2 and U3. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the U2 and U3 are angular rates, and Q U1 is going to be a linear rate. So now we're going to use one, U1. Um, so this is another key thing here. I, I want to explicitly define the linear velocity of um, P, A, B, and N to be U1 times N, X. And so this ensures that now we have all our U's are defined in these um, uh, for the velocities. And now if I calculate other velocities relative using any of the angular velocities in this linear velocity, I'm going to get things only in the function only as a function of the U's. So uh, for example, um, we're going to have to calculate the velocity of BO. I like um, setting things up to use the V2 point theory and I can do um, with respect to PAB, they're both in the same body. In the end frame is where I want, I want the velocity and then they're both belong, they both are in B. And so I can calculate that velocity of BO and notice, right, I have uh, it as a function of the use. And I forgot to make my uh, use. Um, no, they're, they're right. I have underscores. So go ahead and create now the. Uh, you can you can calculate them in a number of ways, but create the velocities for PBC, PC, or, um, and PAB. No, we got PAB. PBC and PC right, might be useful. In fact, we only need PC. PBC is inconsequential, if you recall, um, for FR and FR star. We only need the velocities of the masses, the center of mass. Um, so you can decide if you want to calculate that intermediate velocity or not. You could use a few approaches.
it's defined incorrectly in the ang angular velocities. Or scroll up and see how you defined your um, u's originally. Oh, u1, u2, u3. And then you set it right here to u1. Maybe execute that again. And then go and then execute the following cells. B, A, B. You execute that and then that because the velocity is not that. Huh, what in the heck? U1. Oh, that's uh, in the U2. What, where does that come in? Do a uh, kernel restart run all. <laughs> I wonder if we're just um, having a goofy. Uh, some some variable is um, darn. U one, U two, U three. C and N is U. Um, that's supposed to be U two, U three. That, that's the mistake that not uh, not called out. Ma, I still not, don't have your name. What what's your first name? I'm supposed to call you. Um, nah, that's right. I, I think I said it right, but just not good pronunciation. <laughs> okay, so I'll go and grab um, P A B. You know, we got that P B C. I can do the same thing. It also is in the same body as PAB. So we could get that velocity. And then I'll just use the two-point theorem again to get uh, PC. So PBC and PC are in the same body, or in the same reference frame, C. And that gives me the linear velocities of all the points that I'm going to need. All right, we got that, and they should. Uh, okay. So, so that, and that, you know, makes sense. We don't have too complicated of a system, but we have a velocity in the nx plus this lu2, right, is that first pendulum, plus, and you got to add the angular velocities of both l times the sum of those two angular velocities. That's the omega of C and N. Okay? Okay, so those are linear velocities. Now, um, we want to define, let's define all of these um, generalized, um, well, let's, let's call them, uh, um, I usually say loads, forces, and torques. I can spell it. So these are also vectors, and um, if you recall, um, the resultant on a at, at point A B, um, we had three things. We had F minus the spring force, which is going to be K times Q one, and then minus C times. And notice I'm going to put this in terms of the generalized speed U one. And all of that is in the x, x direction. Okay. Um, on particles, um, the center of mass of the B, uh, body B and the uh, particle C only had gravity. So create those two resultant forces on the center of mass of body B and the particle PC in the same fashion there.
your two resultants on those particles should look like that. Gravity is always in the in y direction. And mass times mass of that particle times g negative in, in negative in y direction. So <clears throat> the last thing is the um, torque on uh, body B. We'll call that TB. And yes, last time we defined that as this specified torque plus KT times, in this case, it's going to be the angle between body B and um, body C. And we've got the sense of those correct, and that is going to be about the NZ axis. So we have uh, all of our resultants now. And we've got all the velocities we need. And I guess let me, um, let's go back above the loads and torques and make a section explicitly um, called uh, angular accelerations. Uh, we're going to need the angular acceleration of the body B for our FR star calculation. So I'll call this um, alpha of B and N equals. And we can just um, ask Senpai to calculate that for us, basically. So we can do um, B dot ang -vela velocity N, ang -vel N, N, and then look at that. Oh, sorry. We're doing accelerations. Ang, A-C-C-N. And we get a U2 dot. Calculates that for us. We're also going to need the accelerations of the three particles that have mass. So that's going to be A of PAB and N equals PAB dot ACC and N. Will that calculate that automatically? Forget. U1 dot. And then um, A um, of P of BO is going to be, that may, let me just see if that does this automatically, and if we don't have to calculate the, uh, do it with the A2 point theory. Yeah, it gets it for us correctly. So all the accelerations can just be calculated like this without too much th thought. Last one, PC and N equals PC dot ACC and N. So we're going to need those in the R star, I mean the F star calculations to get all of our um, R star and T star parts. Okay. Okay. So everything above loads, forces, and torques are the kinematics. And now we're adding in the aspects of the dynamics that we need. So here uh, we're going to define inertia, same mass and inertia. Um, the mass of the two particles M, is just MA and MC. They're just symbols. We don't have to define anything specific, but we do need an inertia dyadic for the rigid body. So I'm going to make IB as my inertia dyadic, and I'm going to use the, this convenience function here, and I'm going to say that uh, this is just planar motion. And this is a question Chris asked me before class started, but I'm just going to say that I x x with respect to b. So first we're going to define it with respect to the b frame in this convenient function. And then I uh, x x is going to be 0. I y y is 0. And then we're going to use that I b for the z z component, and there'll be no products of inertia. So very simple definition of inertia. So we have a inertia dyadic that only has one component, and that's the scalar in the axis that points out of the board. 
and it's with respect to the, the, bo the body fixed coordinates of that body B. Um, it would be the same expressed in N since BC and NZ are the same. Uh, but these, these aren't necessarily, could, maybe not necessarily true that those are zero or even the products of inertia, but I'm assuming that we have a symmetric thing and that um, due to this planar motion, I don't have to worry about rotation about X or Y. So I have this very simple definition for this example. And then, like I said, the other, uh, we just had M, MA and MC. Those are the other two pieces of the puzzle right there. So now um, we have everything that we need to calculate FR and FR star. So let's start with um, FR, since it's typically a little simpler. So generalized active forces. Um, let me let me go up to back into kinematics just to uh, be more explicit here and have everything sort of in an order that makes sense. Let's do partial velocities up here under linear velocities. All right, so I'm make a new cell. Um, there's some nice convenience functions that um, are helpful. We know that we can take, um, for example, we, we're going to need to know the partial velocity of um, PAB in N um, differentiate with respect to U1, and we can get these um, in the N frame. I'm doing those in the right order. It's, oops, NC. I'm doing this in the wrong order. Differentiate with respect to U1 in the N frame. Right, that'll give us a partial velocity. Well, um, there's also every point in every reference frame has a partial velocity convenience function. So if I want it in N with respect to U1, I type it like that, get the same result. And you can also do this, PAB dot partial velocity of NN with respect to U1, U2, and U3. So I can list all three of them, and then it returns all the partial velocities there. We're also going to need the partial velocity of um, BO. So I can get those like so. And we're going to need the partial velocity of PC, NN, U1, U2, U3. We get those. And um, lastly, we need the um, partial velocity of the bot reference frame B, NN, respect to 1, U1, U2, and U3. So that... Um, you can use this convenience function and then get them all in one shot like that, which is nice. Or or one at a time instead. Of, but it just call you know it's just calling that underneath the hood, so you don't don't have to do that. But partial velocities. Okay, so now we have all the kinematics explicitly defined. Accelerations. Any questions up up to this point where where we're at? This is all making sense. So this is a reference frame, and reference frames and points have a convenience method called partial velocity that works like just like that. Only, only um, we probably should make, um, I'll show you, we haven't got to, there's also a rigid body thing too, but it doesn't have that method. I probably should make it available on that method, on that object too. But um, points and reference frames um, capture kinematic information. And so that's why they, they both have these um, partial velocity methods. Okay, back down here, generalized active forces. So um, with all these things in, uh, in this format, we get to 
take advantage of some of the um, repetitiveness. So I'm going to create a list here called U of all the U's. And I'm going to say FR equals an empty list. If you recall, FR is the sum of some different terms for each rth velocity. Okay? So this is the first, second, and third velocity, right? And they are, they are uh, r equals 1 to 3. And so FR, I want to calculate what FR1 is, FR2, and FR3. So I want, I want to have a list of item of three long with three equations for our three degrees of freedom in this system. And um, I'm going to start with an empty list, and then I'm going to do um, a loop for u, r, n, u. And that's just going to give me all the u's. Um, I'm going to say fr.append to that list this summation of things. So we need the partial velocities with respect to ur dotted with all these resultant things. So the first one, we'll start with um, PAB, partial velocity, NN, because we're, we're, we're calculating FR with respect to N, um, with respect to the first U, UR. And then I dot that with the resultant on AB. So that's the first term. I calculate the partial velocity, dot it with the resultant on that, that, part, that, that mass, that particle. Now I can add the other terms. Um, why don't you all do that, right? We need P, PC is the other particle with mass. And then BO is the other particle with mass. But then there's also the term associated with the resultant torques acting on body B. So there's three more terms there that you can sum, right? They'll look very similar to this, but you have to pick the right points or the right reference frames and the uh, right part in the right partial velocity. And once you do that, have a look at what FR is.
me to write the equation on the board? Or can you remember it from he from your head? Oh, you've got it. You've got it in the notes. I see. So all the all the points, right? Only the only the critical points that have mass, the particles that have mass, and then the center of mass. And then there's also the term associated with partial velocity of um, the angular velocity of B in N dotted with that resultant torque. And we call that TB. So if I do that, I get FR. And I'm going to um, suggest putting FR inside of a SymPy matrix, like so. And then um, we have a row, a column vector here, basically, where each row is a um, um, well, <clears throat> recall that B is a reference frame. Up above, um, let's go back up here. Right here, I, I called B partial velocity. So let's just get the angular velocity of B, angular velocity in N, is that. And then I would do diff with respect to u1 um, in n, I think it's, uh, I don't like the order of that, right, 0, but, and then u2 and u3. And notice that that, that gives the same results of he here. So if you have a reference frame, the partial velocity knows to calculate the angular velocity of b with respect to n. Right, we have all the same information here. And um, all this all this is doing is calling that. There's not, nothing magical there. So we do get the angular velocity if we use the partial velocity method 
Um, it, maybe it would have been a better name to call it the partial angular velocity, but um, we didn't do that for some reason. Uh, one last thing, if I, I could, for small systems like this where the equations aren't too big, we can use some simplification. I think that will make it a little, a little simpler. And we see that we've got these, right, here's the forcing term. That's a linear force. This is the um, other two equations associated with the angular rates, u2 and u3. And we get um, a little more complicated terms here that are the uh, contributions um, the gen of the gen that generalized active force on the system um, with respect to U2 and U3. Right? But we see a few things here, right? We see terms due to gravity. We see the term due to that torque, um, spring torque, and then this torque that's applied. Okay, so these are all the effects on you, of how all the forces affect U2, and here's all, how all the forces affect U3. And this one, you know, should look very sim familiar. It's just the simple pendulum um, result here where we have the torque due to the mass of the pendulum. So there's FR. And notice, notice that we got to write this in a loop. So uh, Keynes' method... It's very systematic. We do, we just have all these U's. I loop through the U's, da da da. And if I, I can, you could even imagine adding while well, I loop through all of the bodies and the particles. So I could have two loops: loop through bodies and particles, and then the inner loop loop through each U, and I could formulate these things. So it's very tidy. Um, in that as in that sense. Um, you know, and this, this repetition that we have here could be eliminated with an um, outer loop, too. We'll, I'll just leave it there. It's fine for now. Next thing is, uh, where are we at? Let's take a five-minute break, come back at um, 5.06. And I uh, haven't been doing this very well, but if you want to give me some feedback, right, remember this uh, tiny URL.com. If you have a question that you want, don't want to ask, I'll look at that. Detailed Python syntax, but notice um, that uh, I have a four space indentation here. <clears throat> In Python, um, you don't have to write curly braces around the body of a loop or something like that because it depends on the indentation. And that's important for when we define functions and loops. So the error that um, in your... Sh I can't remember your name either. She? Shin? 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 Shi? So I had two parts maybe. Um, he had these indented. And that caused his code to fail. Um, and these we want to call afterwards. So I first create a list, append things to the list. And then after the list is completed, I transform it into a, a simplified matrix. So be aware of that indentation. OK, let's move on. So the generalized inertia forces, we'll call FR star. We can do it in a very similar way. For U R and U, we have to create this summation. You all like to try that one on your own? You have the equation that we developed. Um, now you have to dot with the negative um, resultant inertial forces and torques. So. See if you can do the same style there and create an FR star.
How many people have completed that? The first three should be not too hard. Um, just make sure you get the mass and acceleration of the three points that you're, you're dotting that with, and, and then it's negative. The last one for the inertial torque resultant um, may be a little more complicated.
Okay, I think I got that. So that that last one, nega, nega, negative alpha of B and N dotted with the central inertia dyadic, plus this um, I of B, uh, this initial uh, inertial central central inertia dyadic would be dotted with the angular velocity of B and N, and then you cross it with B angular velocity N. Turns out that that's not going to be too too complicated of a thing for us, um, but uh, like if I just copied that piece and we saw what that looked like, right? That's all that ends up being in a planar motion with only a one component. But if you had 3D angular velocity and an angular acceleration and a full inertia dyadic with all six inertia scalars, this thing can be quite the monster, okay? But that's what we would expect, right? All we have is this thing um, having a, um, al I alpha dot, I mean I alpha, basically. And then I get a FR star, and that, in that I made a matrix. I simplified it in FR plus FR star. That is our equations of motion there. And this is a funny little, <clears throat> this always annoys me. I, I've, I've never, we've never fixed that bug, but for some reason the, the library we use to print the math always does that. Uh, puts the second bracket on these things. It's annoying. Anyways, if we look at these equations, um, you know, they're, they're decent. We've got a decent problem here. Uh, but there's three equations, this one, this one, and this one. Right, this is the the one associated with the U1, the linear, and then the two rotationals, the rotational of the middle body and the rotation um, associated with the uh, torques generated by that mass um, at the end of the simple pendulum. And we see the F and the T in the associated equations here because uh, they are, happen to be um, aligned with those generalized speeds. They don't have components in multiple generalized speeds. Uh, and another key thing is, right, it's all in the function of, here we have u's, u dots, and q's. There are no q dots because we eliminated them with our kinematical differential equations. There's a convenience function called find dynamic symbols. And if I use that, notice that it finds everything that's a function of t in these equations, f, t, Q1, Q2, Q3, U1, U1, 2, da, da, da. No Q dots, right? Because we've eliminated those with our kinematical differential equations. Um, and then this, if you do, um, let's, I'm going to store this in something, I'm going to say it's equal to zero, so I'm going to just call it zero. And then I'm going to do zero dot free symbols. That gives all of the core symbols that are in here. Notice that all, all these ones that are a function of time are just, just to T. They're all functions of time. But then those are our, um, all of the uh, constants, too, that matter there. And we see that they're all present. Okay? One other important thing is that you are guaranteed to get terms that are linear in the U dots. Okay, so right, for example, here, u1 dot, there's linear terms. I'm never going to find a cosine of a u1 dot. I'm never going to find a u1 dot squared. Nothing nonlinear. There's always going to be linear terms associated with u dots. And that, and that comes from um, right, this. The, this is Newton's law that says the acceleration is linearly related to the forces, okay? So that's what we find. And um, if you then do, um, so we had U, right? This is also useful to turn into a matrix to help us with some calculations. So I can just do that now, and, I'll, and, and uh, U will be a matrix. Right? 
if I do, I'm going to say m equals uh, 0 dot Jacobian of u diff. What, do you, what should that return? If I take the Jacobian of this column vector, 0, with respect to the u dots, what would we expect to get there? If all of each equation only has u dots that are linear, have linear coefficients, what might you accept? If I take the derivative, the Jacobian, if you recall, how many people remember what the Jacobian is? I guess that would that'd be one question. You don't? The Jacobian is the uh, is a matrix of partial differential differential differentials, partial derivatives, <laughs> partial derivatives with respect to um, all those variables u1 dot u2 dot u3 dot. Right, so u diff is just like we've done before. We get the u dots, and if I um, if I want to get the coefficients of all the u dots in these equations, then if I take the partial derivative with respect to u dot of that equation, it's going to return to me the linear coefficient. Right, because any time I have a linear term and I take the derivative with respect to one of those terms, I'm just going to get the coefficient. So this is a quick way to get the coefficients. All right, so these are all the linear coefficients. If I do m and then take a look at this, let's. Um, I think we may be able to. I thought this might trick some, some, or maybe we already have, but let's just try that. So I can't show it all here, but there's, um, if you look at m dot shape, I've got a 3 by 3 matrix. I have three equations and three u dots. And notice, it's going to be a little hard to see here, but uh, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. Each of, This is the coefficient of u1 dot in the first equation, coefficient of u2 dot, coefficient of u3 dot. Second equation, the same thing. We have values on the here, but notice that it's symmetric. Two that equals to that, that equals to this, and you can look at it on your screen, and that equals to that. It's a symmetric matrix, three by three, right? It's the number of degrees of freedom by the number of degrees of freedom, and um, if I do me dot find dynamic symbols of m, it only has q's in it. Right? There's no u dots because we are getting the coefficients of u dots. There's no u's though, and that's that's what's gonna that's what you can always find. There's no u's, but there may be q's. So we have this, and this is called um, typically called the mass matrix. Okay, it, it is the you know, in Newton's law, it's it's this, but in matrix form. Um, it's all of the mass and inertial related terms um, for those equations of motion. And we were able to pull off those coefficients. Okay. So, if I write uh, 0 equals fr plus fr star, and I, here I factored out um, m. Well, m times the u dots plus something. I'm going to just call it, um, we already used f. Let's call this uh, g. This is some function now, right? All the u dots are here. So this is a function of the q's, the u's. Um, the constants in time. That equals fr plus fr star. And I want to write it as, uh, I'm going to write it, that as a negative. So fr and fr star can always be written in this form. 
the mass matrix times the u dots minus some function, nonlinear function of these variables. Right? And this is useful because, um, I don't recall, this is, this is zero. If I write this now, Okay, so that equals zero. Then I can move g to the right-hand side. And if I take the inverse, multiply by the inverse, pre-multiply, I would get what my u dots are. Yeah? Those are our u dots. And remember that we've also defined q dots equal, um, what do we use? I'll just use h of the uh, u's and t. These are the kinematical differential equations, right? This, there's three of these in our case. Um, so we, we could uh, say this is um, uh, n by 1, right? And this is also n by 1 for a holonomic system. So we have q dots and u dots. These are called um, the explicit first order form um, of the differential equations. Right, so kinematical and dynamical. Dynamics kinematics, all of, we have to integrate all of these to find out what the q's and the u's are. So we have an explicit set of first order differential equations that if I integrate these, so if I call um, x equals uh, q stacked with u, right, these are vectors, then the integral of x with respect to time from some initial t to some final t gives me, um, I'm sorry, uh, I meant to write this as x dot, q dot, u dot. All right, so I have q dot, u dot, stack them in a column vector x dot. If I integrate x dot with respect to time, then I get x, where x equals the time evolutions of q and u. And that's what we're interested in. All right? So we have these equations. Um, most numerical integrate, um, uh, one key thing is that if they're very simple linear equations, you can analytically do this integral. But in general, you can't do this integral. Uh, with nonlinear equations. That's the case with our problem right now. So we use numerical integration to, to, to solve this. And most numerical integration routines need the equations put into first order explicit form. OK? That operation, though, is computationally intensive for big N. And it turns out that um, um, if I have m u dot uh, g, you can solve that by Gaussian elimination. It's a linear system. Um, and you may know that um, in, th in this, this equation, too, I pointed out it's symmetric. It also, in almost all cases, is positive, positive semi-definite. So there's some tricks, then, that you don't have to use just plain Gaussian elimination. You can use the Cholesky decomposition. And um, you can solve this with less computational, fewer computational steps. But in general, um, if, 
m right is n by n. Um, in terms of computation, it scales by the cube, right? This is a big O notation. I can't remember if they write it, how they write it, but how many computational steps involve in doing this, solving this, um, scales with n cubed. You really want n, right, for the best computational algorithms. So in general, we have this nasty computation to, computation to do. And if you try to do m inverse of the symbolic form, you can do it for small n, but uh, symbolics are fundamentally slower than numerics. And if you try to do this in m inverse for big N, um, it's not going to be that, that pretty. All right? Questions there? Did I do it incorrectly? Um, if I dot with an inertia dyadic, I get a vector, and then I cross two vectors. If I cross a vector with inertia dyadic first, um, I'm going to get a I'm going to get a dyadic, I think. And then I dot it. I think either way works. I think it's. Um, Did you? Uh, the equation. I forget. Does anybody? I've forgotten whether how the cross product works with the dyadic. Um, the equation is negative alpha uh, dotted with the central inertia dyadic. Plus omega b and n um, crossed central inertia dyadic dotted with omega b and n, right? And I did that operation before this operation, and I don't recall off the top of my head if. Um, I know this operation gives you a vector. And then this operation, if I wanted to do omega across a dyadic, um, I can't remember actually exactly what that, uh, that probably is valid. Yeah, vector, vector, dot, I get a vector here. So I all end up getting a vector. But if I do this cross product first, it should be um, associative, right? Is that the word I'm looking for? Um, I think I think it should come. I feel like it should come out the same. But maybe a dyadic is a dia is a uh, dot and cross product with a dyadic not associative. If it's not associative, then it won't come out the same. And I can't remember that off the top of my head. I'd have to look that up. You didn't get that? I got the identical term, but you didn't get that. I didn't get identical terms. Yeah. Oh. Mine? Not yeah, it doesn't fit on the screen. Then it's, it's the same, I think. OK, so yeah, I think that cross product is valid. I think you get a dyadic. When you cross a vector with a dyadic, you get a dyadic. So if you do this one first, you get a dyadic. You dot that dyadic with this, you get a vector. I think it's associative. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It didn't fit on the screen. Okay. Let's, all right. Now, I made you do all that. And if you noticed, there's, there's some, um, I, I tried to point out the compactness and the uh, repetition that we do in these loops. So um, it turns out that all of that we just did is easily programmable into a uh, common set. So I'm going to introduce um, the easy way here real quickly. Uh, we have convenience functions. And the key things are you make a list of all the bodies and the particles. Oh, first we've got to create those. So we have these um, new types, particle, 
takes, associates a point with a mass. And I can't remember, did I show you these already? I think I did one day, or maybe I didn't. So I can give my particle a name. The first particle is going to be the uh, slider. Let's call it a slider. It's at point AB, and it has mass A. Slider. And then I had the uh, bob of the pendulum, which is also a particle of the simple pendulum at PC, MC. And then we have a body, a rigid body, and we have a uh, rigid body object also. And that rigid body object associates a mass center, a reference frame, mass, and inertia together. Right? Those are all the pieces that you would imagine that make up a rigid body. So we have the uh, compound pendulum. I'll call it pend for short. Give it a name. And then we got the mass center, MB. I'm sorry, P, uh, BO, the point. It's attached to reference frame B. It has mass B. Now the inertia, if you read carefully in the documentation, takes a dyadic and a point. Okay. Tipi the easiest point is the mass center, but you could define your inertia with respect to another point, and sometimes that's useful. So it takes a tuple where the first thing is the inertia dyadic, and the second is the point that that inertia dyadic is defined with respect to. So we defined our inertia dyadic with respect to the center of mass, which is or the point BO. Okay, so I now have a rigid body, mass center BO, inertia defined at BO. There's the dyadic, it's got a mass and a reference frame. So we create that rigid body. And then put these all in a list. Slider, bob, end. All right. Next thing is um, let's make a load, a, a, a container here, just a list of all of the forces, resultants, forces and torques that act at certain points in reference frames. So this takes, um, we're going to have pairs of objects here. I'll put them in a tuple also. We first give it a, um, a point. So we know that uh, PAB, there's a resultant AB at that point. At point PC, a resultant C. At point BO, a resultant BO. And a point, um, I'm sorry, the rigid body B, or the reference frame B, and TB. So this tells us all of the resultants acting on each of the points and the resultant torque acting on associated reference frame. This was the same kind of information we needed to calculate um, the items above. And now um, I'll introduce this very nice convenience function, Keynes method. It has a lot of arguments here, but the key thing is you want to pick an inertial frame. You want that the equations with respect to. You give it the independent generalized coordinates, independent generalized speeds, the kinematical differential equations, which we've already defined. And then if you have non-holonomic systems, there's some things for dependent configuration constraints etc. And we'll talk about some of this other stuff next time. For us, with a simple holonomic system, we give the frame in, the inertial frame. We give Q, U, the kinematical differential equations. We call that KDEs above, I believe. And then I'm going to the output of that will store in an object called Kane. Q is not defined. Oh, maybe I didn't define Q. So we'll just do this. Q1, Q2, Q3, 
three. And we did define u. All right? Now, fr, comma, fr star equals Kane, that Kane equation, Kane's equations. If I look at the help for that, it takes a list of bodies and a list of loads. And with that, those lines right there, we did all we did above for the generalized active forces. And if you look at fr and fr star, we should have the same equations. Okay? So, all of the information about all the bodies, and notice that the points are included here, so all of the velocities and accelerations are in the particles and rigid bodies. And then we add all the loads, and we call Kane's method, Kane's equation, bam, we get the equations. One other useful, um, there's other, lots of other things associated with this Kane object. There's our mass matrix that we just calculated. And then this is um, forcing is G. So, where am I going? I'm probably going too fast. For the holonomic system, we give it the Q's, the U's, the kinematical differential equations, and all the bodies and the loads that we've defined. And we get FR equals FR star. And it, and it also automatically calculates this form, this MG form that I showed here. We get M and we get G. Questions? Chris. No, nope. your project you can solve any way you want to solve it. On the exam, I may ask you specifics about how to calculate generalized active forces, generalized inertial forces, etc. Yeah. So, um, convenience is your friend for your project. Go, for, go for it. Just get the right answer. Okay. Other questions? Okay, we've got, dang, how many minutes left? I, thought, I was thinking, oh, we've got 10 more. I can show you the simulation. So I didn't get the simulation and visualization. But um, <clears throat> we're now going to, this is all we need to do in symbolic land. And now we're, we're going to go to numeric land. And so ne next time, the first thing we're going to do is import this uh, additional package called PyDi. And there's two important things that PyDi does. One is that it um, efficiently trans transfor transforms these symbolic equations into uh, nice numerical methods to evaluate them. Um, and, and then it also um, has a uh, system object that lets you uh, define a numerical dynamic system, essentially, and, and, and solve, integrate this very easily. And then it has another uh, sub-package that lets us do uh, 3D animations of the motion. So we'll do that next time, probably the first half. In the second half, I'll talk about how to um, bring non-contributing forces, how to calculate non-contributing forces of systems. That's, that's what I'm hoping to get to. And then. Um, this, this is a, uh, gets pretty fun, I think, when you finally get to see these moving. I've showed you uh, t derivatives nonstop for seven, six or seven weeks now, and uh, we'll finally get to see something move. Um, after the first day, I showed you animations. But <laughs> Okay, let's wrap it up.